this fulfillment in Christ. You think about this today, and you look at our text from Philippians chapter 4, as the New King James says here, Paul says, now, not that I speak in regard to need, he says, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. You know, that is hard to do sometimes. Um, when things are going poorly, especially in the sense of monetarily, or if you ever had had an automobile or multiple automobiles in the shop at the same time or very close together, you don't feel so content anymore. You get a little bit irritated and maybe you get a little bit concerned about how to handle those things. But we notice here that Paul says, he says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And I think about who is saying that and all the things that he endured for Christ. It's amazing that he can say that he has learned in whatever state he is to be content. Because if you know where most of Paul's letters were written from, and a lot of the New Testament was written by Paul, we know that four of his letters were written from prison. And it's amazing he can say that he has learned in whatever state he is in to be content. I, could, I find it hard to be content if you are in prison and having to write and communicate to other congregations from a prison cell. But he did that on at least four occasions with the, the four prison epistles, as we call them. If you think about this also, we look at Philippians 4, verses 11 and 12. Who really wants to be poor? That is, who really wants to be a person who really has to struggle day after day, week after week with something? It's, it's not something that we would enjoy. Who wants to be without a home? Who wants to be hungry on a constant basis? Not because you missed a meal, but because you cannot afford to buy food. And to, and to be able to feed yourself or your family. We all understand the value of having an abundance of material blessings. When we say abundance of material blessings, we mean that the Lord has provided for us in such a way that we may not have the nicest or the best of everything, but we are able to provide for our own, provide for ourselves. You think about that, especially today with so much uh, questionable things going on, even the economy, we have to remember how blessed we are to even have the things that we have because there are so many others, especially in other parts of the world, who have so much less than what we have. It's nice to be blessed through many avenues that we can be blessed, but physical belongings and possessions should not determine our happiness. You look here at Philippians chapter 4, I believe that's what Paul is getting to, is that physical things shouldn't determine if we're happy or if we're sad. Now we all, I'm sure, have been in that place where we're not too thrilled about the state that we're in because of various different things that could be going on. But does our happiness hinge upon material blessings or material possessions? We see here in verse 12 of Philippians chapter 4 that Paul says, I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. That is, he knows how to suffer. He knows how to handle when things are going very well for him. He says, Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. He knows what it's like to be on both sides of those things. This morning, let's begin by looking at his uh, first statement here, Know how to abound. It is possible to abound and be pleasing to God. There are some today who, it seems, if they, if they see someone that's rich, they think, well, they must be sinners because they're doing something to have something as simple to attain that kind of wealth. Well, if you look at Job chapter 1 and look at verse uh, 3, the Bible says, And the Lord says, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Let's go back to Job 1. I barely have those slides switch around. Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. So you notice here in verse 1, he first talks about the character of Job. He is a godly man. He is a man, he says, who is blameless and upright. And then we get into verse 2 to see some of the blessings of Job. He says in verse 2, And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. That's ten children. I can't imagine having ten children in my home. I don't know where we would put them all. But you think about Job, he has ten, seven sons and three daughters. And I notice also in verse 3, Also his possessions were seven thousand sheep. 
3,000 oxen, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. You think about that, 7,000 sheep. That is a lot of animals. And you add in more than just that, 3,000 camels. You think about just the livestock that Job has here. It would take a large mass of servants to take care of those things, to make sure they were cared for properly. And the Bible goes on to say in verse 3, in a very large household, so this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. He, ha he is looked upon here as having a large amount of possessions, but also remember verse 1, he was pleasing in the sight of God. We go to verse 8 of Job 1. We see that here again how the Lord talks about how Job is righteous. Even though he has all these blessings, it wasn't a hindrance. He had all those things even while still being faithful to God. Because you think about that today, how many people have the problem that when they're blessed physically and materialistically, that they're no longer so faithful to God? When I was talking to Brother Stacy Ferguson, when him, we were planning to go to uh, Fiji here in, in June, and Lisa and I and Chloe Joe all planning to go through that, Lord willing, and he was talking about, he said, now where we're going this year, he said, it's a lot different than where we went to last year. Remember last year we went to the Marshall Islands, an island uh, called Madro. If you look it up, it's literally a dot in the ocean. There's not, not, not much there. He said, it's going to be a lot different. He said, when you go to Fiji, he said, he said it's going to feel like New York City because there's so many things going on. And he said, they're going to be hard to reach because of materialism over there. And, and, I, and I knew that ahead of time. Anytime you have a lot of materialism and things, it's hard to reach people. And why is that? Because they're not concerned about God. You give a person a lot of possessions, sometimes, not in every case, but sometimes they begin to think, why do I need God? Look at all that I have. You look at Job, he had a lot of things. He had a lot of possessions. But he also had God, and he also was pleasing in the sight of God. We look at Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 6. We see, that, we see that Abraham also was rich and righteous. Or Abram, as we see here, here he's called in Genesis 13. Then Abram went up from Egypt, but he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him to the south. Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and gold. Now, if the Bible records a man's being very rich, and it mentions specifically in silver and gold... In my mind, that means that man could do whatever he wanted to in material sense. He could have purchased whatever he desired, could have got whatever he wanted. And we see in verse 3, He went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been in the beginning between Bethel and Ai, and to the place of the altar which he had, been, which he had made there at first. And there Abraham, Abram called the name of the Lord. Lot also, who went with him, went, with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. Now the Lord, excuse me, now the land was not able to support them. They might dwell together, for the possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. They had so much they couldn't even live side by side. Could you imagine having a brother or a relative who you who have so much possessions you can't even live side by side because your livestock would just it would just wipe out the land. That's how blessed these two men are. Now we know which one makes a good decision about where they dwell and which one makes a poor one. But we see here these two men, especially Abram, was pleasing the sight of God even with all his possessions. Now we think about how to abound. We must remember those who are in need. In James 1 and verse 27, the Bible says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You know, there are, there are numerous examples, Old Testament, New Testament, where we see that the church, the, the faithful of God, in the Old Testament, the church, and the New Testament, were to take care of others and help those who were, were in need. You remember why there were seven appointed there in the book of Acts to perform works that were similar to that of a deacon? Because there are some people who are being overlooked in the daily distribution. What were they doing? What does that tell us? That they were looking out for each other. We go to Acts 2 at the, at the very beginning of the, of the church and follow. And you see what's going on. They begin to sell the, their possessions and give them to what? To the church. 
And then the Bible tells us they distributed them as each one had need. They looked out for one another and cared for one another. And we see here in verse 27, notice what he's talking about here. He says, visiting the orphans and the widows and their trouble, because who do orphans have to rely on? Almost nobody. Almost no one. We could say, oh, well, they could be in a children's home. Well, <laughs> you were talking to a child in a, in, a, in a children's home. They don't have a lot. You think about some of those young men out at Westview that we, we provide support for and help that work. Those young men, they don't have a lot. Whatever they have is very little, and I can tell you they probably cherish what little things they have. And you talk to those individuals when they come and, and to pick up different things we provide for that work. Those young men also work for what they have. But my point is, they have very little people to rely on. We also see orphans. So orphans have very little people to rely on. Widows, who are they going to rely on, especially if they have no family to help them in certain areas? What are they going to do? That's why the church, as we see here, is supposed to help those who are, he says, in their trouble, that is, in their struggles, to maintain what? A livelihood that they can survive upon. He says, and keep oneself unspotted from the world. Doing these things, he says, is pure and undefiled religion before God. It means it's nothing to be what? Be ashamed of, but is pure and undefiled before God. We look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Here the Bible says, Command those who are rich in this present age. You know, you notice how he terms that. He says, in this present age. Because there are those who won't be so rich in the age to come. That is, the afterlife. He says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor trust in their uncertain riches. That's what the Great Depression taught people back in the 20s and the 30s during that time period, or the 30s. Rather. And also, when this recession hit, what did it do? It humbled a lot of people. It brought them back down. They had to reevaluate, well, what's really important here? Who gives, he says, nor trust in uncertain riches, but, but, in the, but in the living God. And that is the whole point, really, of our lesson this morning. Not to trust in riches, but in the living God. He who says, gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, and let them be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. What does that mean? That as we have the ability, because we know some of us, it's hard for us to help others because we're struggling ourselves. But when we have abilities to do that, it is what? A command, it is an example we see here to help those who are in need. I remember when I was in preaching school, if you ever talk to preaching students how they have to raise support or anyone, it's not fun, it's not easy, it's very stressful. And you really, it's not fun when you talk with a congregation about money or anyone's about money. I never enjoyed doing those types of things. It made me very uncomfortable having to do those things, and it still does. But I remember visiting a congregation there in Missouri, and I was talking to them about what I was trying to do, and I preached the lesson that, smart, that morning, answered all these questions they had that they wanted to ask me. And they said, now you need to go over here and talk to this other congregation. I said, okay. He said, they have money. You just have to get them to let go of it. You know what he's talking about? They weren't willing to share. As a congregation, it also applies to the Lord's church. Where we, are, we, where we have been blessed, we are to help others who are in need. That's why when you think about this congregation itself, when you go out and look at that little white binder, it shows all the works we support. That's why there's 18 things on there. Because we're more, more than willing to share. Rightfully so. We want to help those who are doing good works and deserve the, our support because they are doing works and doing those things which are pleasing the sight of God. We must know, we know how to abound. We must know also how to share and to be a part of those uh, who are, help those who are struggling so they also can come out of their difficulties. So we must know how to abound and we must know also how to be a uh, base. That is how how to deal with times when we are not abounding and do not have plentiful things. We may not have plenty of everything, but we must know the difference between a need and a want. If you go to Matthew chapter 6 and look at verses 33 and the previous verses, what's the verse you hear quoted the most? It's verse 33, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. 
The problem we have today is people today like to describe those things that are being added unto you as your needs. However, if you go back and look at the previous verses, he never once mentions how the Lord provide for our, our, our wants, but our needs. I said that backwards. They will say that the needs there are our wants, that the Lord will give you whatever you desire. You turn on the television, some of, our, some of those evangelists on TV and those speakers on TV will tell you, well, the Lord will give you whatever you want. In reality, the Lord will provide for our needs. We look at Matthew 6, verses 33, and previous to those verses, he talks about how the Lord provides for those who are in need. If you think about the poor widow in Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 41, the Bible says, Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money in the treasury and how many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Surely I say to you that the poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. Why is that? Because she would fill those two mites probably for the next few days and even for the next few weeks. That if she gave, even when she didn't have a lot to give, she still gave. He says in verse 44, for they, put, for they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. It seems that the Christ is telling us that she gave the last of what she had. She also, as we see thinking about those types of things, she had a lot of faith in God. To give her whole livelihood, as Christ says there in verse 44, she had an abundance of faith in God. Even during her times of having very little, she still gave to God. Lazarus, we see in Luke chapter 16, in Luke 16, looking at verses 19 through 21, we see Lazarus had very little. He actually was uh, really a beggar trying just to, to maintain enough to live physically. The Bible says there was a certain rich man who, who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs, which was from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Lazarus was abased. He was struggling. But what happens when we finish reading that story? The roles are reversed, aren't they? When they both men die, one and the two basically, you want, you want to say, just switch places. Lazarus was now bounding in the bosom of Abraham. He was bounding in paradise. And the rich man was what? He was now abased. He was now in torments. As he says, he was tormented in the flame. But we see here what is Lazarus doing. We see in verses 19 through 21, we see his condition. And we know by his final destination that he was what? Pleasing the sight of God. Even in the midst of his hardships. We at times will suffer as well. Romans 12 verse 15 tells us we may suffer emotionally as well. The Bible tells us rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I think about two situations in life where we often rejoice. New child coming into the world, maybe a wedding. What some times when we have to weep? Loss of a loved one? Loved one straying from the faith? We rejoice with those who have a reason to rejoice and weep with those who have a reason to weep. And we are comfort them as they are going through that time of being abased, that time of struggling. We too as Christians will suffer hardships. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says, Yes, and all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you remain faithful to God... Someone at some point in your life is going to be upset because you are doing what is pleasing in the sight of God and they disagree with it. How many of us have opened our mouth and tried to stand up for what we believe in concerning the Bible and someone didn't like it? Or if we disagree with what they were doing, what they were saying, and they didn't like it? If you think that never happens, come to our food pantry here on the third Saturday and sit in the Bible class and watch people's faces. Not everybody likes what's said. Not everybody likes what is being told. Even though we read from the Bible and discuss those things, it doesn't matter. Because those who want to live right and pleasing in the sight of God, there are times and sometimes it's a lot that we're going to suffer persecution. We think, we think persecution, what comes to your mind 
We may think, well, I'm not being killed. I'm not being drug up to a cross to be crucified. I'm not being set on fire. I'm not doing having those things happen to me. You know, persecution takes a lot of forms. You know, I think a lot of times today we forget that persecution, probably 90% of it, is mental. People say something to us when we stand up for what is right, and it just bothers us for a long time. Because, not because what they said necessarily offended us, because when someone disagrees with the Bible, we recognize that they are not in fellowship with God. Not because they disagree with us, because when they disagree with the Bible. Yes, all desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Know how to abound, know how to be a base, and we must know how to be content. That is a hard thing to tell people today, to be content, especially when the new iPhone comes out. Are you content? You know, a lot of people spend a lot of money to purchase those things. You know, those types of things aren't necessarily bad. When we make a lot of big sacrifices, and especially sometimes when it comes to God, willing to give up a lot to gain what? Larry will tell people we have the newest gadget. You know, I'm a gadget man myself, but we have to make sure that we keep ourselves right on the side of God and not put those things higher than where they ought to be. If you were to write out your priority list, and who is most important? Who is at the top of the list? Or maybe I should say, what is at the top of the list? Some of us, it might be an item. We have to remember that what Christ told us, we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, which means that God, the church, they must be at the top of the list. Because if they're anywhere else, they're in the wrong place. Today is Super Bowl Sunday, isn't it? The game starts, I believe, according to ESPN, about 5.30. Our service starts at 5 o'clock. Now, there are some people in some places that have a hard time saying, well, you know, the game's on. I know a good brother who's recording it. He's having the brethren come over afterwards. He said, we're going to skip through the commercials and this, that, and the other. We can watch it. Those who want to watch it after services. Well, they're making sure they're doing that God comes first. So there's nothing wrong with being engaged in activities such as that. The problem is when we say, well, you know, it comes on at the same time. It's only one time of year. So what? There are too many things going on that are getting in the way of God. We keep doing those things and not correct those things. The Lord will not find us pleasing in His sight. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, the Bible tells us, Do not let for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What is Christ telling us? The things we store up in this life, though some are, are out of necessity, but if we get to the point where we're being materialistic and saying, I need this, and when we really don't need it at all, or we want this, and we're being to put those things above God, we need to stop and think, what am I doing? Because we see here in verses 19 through 21, it's not so much the possessions that we have, it's where we put them in our priority list. That's the problem we have today. Possessions are the problem, it's how important we make them to us. How important is it that we have those things? He says in verse 20, he says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. It's amazing that sometimes we were a kid that there are treasures we laid up in heaven. What's the most important thing that we store up to be in heaven? First of all, it's ourselves, our souls, isn't it? One of the greatest treasures we have is that we could possibly be in heaven for pleasing the sight of God. He says, Where neither moth nor rust destroys, nor thieves do not break in and steal. And here is the key in verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It was the most important thing in your life that's going to be evident. Even if it's not evident to you, maybe it's not evident to your spouse, but God will know. You know, we have a bad problem today thinking, well, you know, God doesn't care if I do this, or He doesn't, you know, He's not really seeing this. We kind of have that image in our mind that, well, you know, if I'm not at a church building, and if I'm not... But another church member, nobody's going to know about this. Why, when do we become so foolish to realize that and forget that God sees everything? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
Let's look at Matthew chapter 16. Let's look at verse 26. Here Christ says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And I've always thought that last question is very strong. And I like them both. They're both very important for us. But think about this for a moment. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Anything. I think today men, it seems that men try to find, I say men, I mean mankind in general. It means man and woman. It seems we find more ways to put other things before God. Because every few months, what do we have to do? Remind some brethren that, you know, those things aren't important. Or whatever, whatever it may be, we have to remind people what the Bible teaches. Because the world keeps throwing things at us saying, this is more important. If you're to walk across the street and tell someone that you're not going to watch the Super Bowl tonight, or you're going to come to services, they're going to say, there's a good chance somebody will say, why, can't you miss just once? And I love that question. Can't you miss just once? My question is, why would you miss at all if you don't have to? I don't understand that. I don't understand people who, ha who have that mentality that, well, it's just one time. You know, when a man touched the ark in the Old Testament just one time, what happened? He died. When Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, when they came to Paul, or to Peter rather, and they held back a portion which they had sold their land for, and they lied at least just one time, what happened? They died. All it takes is one sin to separate us from God. That's why it's so important that when we look at what the Bible says, we strive to make ourselves and to mold our lives around the Word of God and not try to mold the Bible around our lives. Because when we try to do the opposite and try to mold the Bible around our lives, we say that God isn't important, we'll just squeeze Him in wherever we can. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, looking at verse 24 and following. Here Paul speaking and says, from the, from the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Five times. He got beat a lot. You think about what it means to get 40 stripes minus one, it means 39 stripes. Those weren't little pats on the back. And have that five times. Three times, he says, I was beaten with rods. He doesn't even mention how many times they actually hit him with the rods. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That should have killed him. Because when you stone someone, the intention is they don't get back up. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A, day, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Paul was always, it seems, in a position that could have taken his life. You go through and look at all those things. He could have died. You might say he should have died, really, in any of those positions. Beating with rods, being shipwrecked. In all these places of trouble, in the waters, and the robbers, the countrymen, the Gentiles, the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, among false brethren. He says, In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. He says, Besides the other things. You notice he takes, he mentions all these things he endures that he has gone through. He's not boasting. He's just stating the facts. Look, this is what I've gone through. And this doesn't even, he says, this is not even what bothers me the most. He says in verse 28, what comes up upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. He endured all those things, but his biggest concern was what state are the churches in? Are they faithful to God? Physically, Lazarus, as we saw in Luke 16, verses 22 through 26, had nothing. But in reality, he had everything. Because what does the Bible tell us there in verses 22 through 26? He's now in a place of rest. A place, the Bible tells us there in verse uh, 22, says, So it was that the beggar died, and he was carried away. 
by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The beggar was who? Lazarus. The rich man also died and was buried. It doesn't mention he was carried to a place of rest. He was actually taken to a place of torment. Verse 23 tells us, And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Who was being comforted? The man who was pleasing the sight of God. It was the rich man who was not right in the sight of God that found no comfort when he came into eternal life. Let's think about this this morning. Are we content in our lives? Are we pleased with where we are? Are we pleased with what we have? The possessions and those types of things. Because if we're not pleased, sometimes we're not content. There's a better word to use. If we're not content with those things, we can put those things before God and therefore put our souls in jeopardy. Let's think about this. Do you have the happiness that nobody can ever take away? But what is the happiness that no one can ever take away? The security of having our souls prepared and ready for eternal life. Trusting in physical blessings will always disappoint, but Christ never will. You think about that statement. Physical blessings will always disappoint. Because everything wears down. Everything begins to stop working properly. If you ever owned a computer, if you own one, you know what I mean. It doesn't take very long before it stops working like it's supposed to. You think, what's going on? With Christ, none of those things happen. So long as you're faithful to God and faithful to Christ, doing what Christ has told us to do through the New Testament, remain faithful to Him, apply our lives to those teachings, our relationship with Him will never deteriorate. It will never need a tune-up. Because when we are faithful to God and pleasing the sight of God, we can be rest assured that we have eternal life. This morning, as you think about these things, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you will repent of your sins, as we see in Acts 2, verse 38, repent of your sins, and confess that Christ is the Son of God, be immersed in baptism so our sins can be washed away. You remember what Ananias said to Paul? Now, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and do what? Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So we repent of our sins, we confess Christ, we are immersed in baptism, so our sins can be washed away. And at the same time, as we see in Galatians 3, verse 27, at baptism, we are placed into the body of Christ. And so long as we remain faithful, as we see in Revelation 2, verse 10, we will receive the crown of life. This morning we also know that as Christians sometimes we're not perfect people. We make mistakes because we're human beings. We say things, we do things, we think things. Maybe we even question some things we ought not to question. We can make ourselves right, ask for prayers to the church, pray for forgiveness of sins, and have ourselves made right in the sight of God. This morning if you have any needs or concerns, you can come forward now. Ask that we stand and sing to encourage you. <laughs>